Welcome, fellow Lions fans. What a great win this past weekend. We were able to overcome the loss of our backup long snapper to beat the Vikings and take our rightful place at the top of the NFC. Help might be on the way, though, as rumors are that Max Crosby's been doing some extra work on his long snapping, despite being limited by a troublesome ankle injury. This ankle injury, I'm afraid, is chronic, maybe even terminal. It's the kind of ankle injury whose only known cure is Superman ice cream with a chaser of Verner's and a trip to a cider mill for some fresh cider and donuts. Unfortunately, none of those are available in the desert of Las Vegas. So let's all get down and pray for Max Crosby's health. Speaking of praying for the health of other teams' players, the Lions' secondary is on their hands and knees right now, praying for the quick recovery of Will Levis from his AC joint injury. Levis missed last game, but he's thrown at least one interception in each of the first five games. Those interceptions, they're not going to throw themselves. I'm Jimmy Liao, University of Michigan Medical School grad and their fourth-string quarterback. This is the medical edition of the Detroit Lions podcast. Today is Wednesday, October the 23rd. I'm going to review Jameson Williams getting a two-game suspension for taking a banned substance, whether Max Crosby is a realistic possibility or not, Tua returning to play without a guardian cap, Debo Samuel hospitalized with pneumonia, all the injuries that came out of the Vikings game, and a review of the initial Wednesday report for the Titans game as we get ready for that. All right, let's get started with JMO's two-game suspension for a stimulant, diuretic, or a masking agent. It would have been six games if it was an anabolic steroid, but a masking agent can hide those, so who knows what he's taking for sure. He's not a strength position kind of guy, so I doubt it's some kind of anabolic steroid. He's also not recovering from an injury for which he might take HGH for. Early in my career, I remember getting this weird anonymous random letter from a person who was asking to see if I'd be willing to prescribe on a regular basis testosterone and HGH. Gotta wonder if that was some kind of professional or college athlete trying to get some legal strength building steroid type medications. There are some kind of regenerative health clinics that you've heard about in Florida, maybe a little bit sketchy, where they will prescribe regularly these kind of medications to people. Famously, Peyton Manning was getting HGH delivered to his house. So we know that NFL players do get these kind of medications. Now, being not a strength guy, probably not a masking agent, though. I'm looking through the masking agent banned substance list for the NFL right now, and it's all diuretics. So what's a diuretic? It's a medication that causes you to urinate a lot. These medications are not something a normal person would be taking without some kind of health condition. So there's a very, very small chance, a 0.001% chance, a doctor prescription would be for a diuretic for Jameson Williams. These things I've prescribed for many times, typically for hypertension, congestive heart failure, edema in the legs. These are not things that JMO would have. More than likely, we're dealing with a stimulant. So let me look through the stimulant list here. I've prescribed many of these also. Some of these are for ADHD, like Ritalin, Adderall. Provigil is something that sometimes primary care doctors will prescribe. A couple of these are also for weight loss medications like Phentermine. So most of these are for weight loss or ADHD. They're not that safe of medications. They can cause cardiac issues. They can also be very addictive. I've seen plenty of people get addicted to these ADHD type of medications before. If he's going to a non-team doctor for ADHD or weight loss medications, well, that's just stupid on his part. That wouldn't make any sense. Guessing a buddy gave it to him and he just took it. Now, Sudafed is also on that list for stimulants. That could cause him to get a suspension here. But if he's taking OTC med, over-the-counter medication, and not running it by the team doctor, that's also stupid on this part. 
The rules are very clear. If you're taking anything into your body, run it by the team doctor to make sure it's okay. It's not that hard to follow that rule. Now, with NFL rules, sometimes they can be confusing, but since this is Jameson's second suspension now for NFL rules violations, he starts to lose some credibility. First one was for gambling. Now, you might be able to say the NFL rules for gambling were a little bit confusing. They, after all, had to drop his suspension from six to four because there was some confusion. But now that this is his second suspension, it's probably not that the NFL rules are confusing. It's that JMO isn't following the rules. All right, now let's get to the Max Crosby discussion. He's the exact kind of character guy that we want for the Lions. This is exactly a great fit for the locker room. Remember last year, he played through a septic knee joint. He was listed as doubtful for the game because he probably should not have been playing. The doctor probably said, shouldn't be playing with a septic knee joint, but he played anyway. Septic knee joints are no joke. You can die from it. It gets into your bloodstream. You need IV antibiotics. This can be a serious issue that affects your whole body. So what's the only way we're going to get this guy? The only way we get him is if he demands a trade or does some kind of a hold-in like a Demonte Adams. Last week, he missed two practices with an ankle issue. So maybe there's something going on behind the scenes there. We need Max Crosby to become a guy who's a little discontent with the Raiders. As Mike Tomlin said, you want volunteers and not hostages on your team. We need Max Crosby to start acting like a hostage. But that also creates a catch-22 here. We don't want a character guy who's going to cause disruption behind the scenes. We don't want a guy who's going to hold in or hold out. But that might be the only way we're actually going to get him. So do we want this guy if we can actually get him? It's a catch-22 here. I remember reading the book Catch-22 a while ago. Very witty, very sarcastic, very well-written book. The catch-22 in that book was there was this guy in a war, and with war being obviously terrible, he wanted to get out of it. So he hatched this plan where he would claim to be mentally ill so he could be discharged. The problem with that plan was only a mentally sane person would claim to be mentally ill to be discharged. A truly mentally ill person would be perfectly content continuing to be in a war. Either way, whether he was mentally ill or mentally sane, he couldn't get out of the war, which was the catch-22. So, trading for Max Crosby, what are the complications here? First, we need to make sure that he's actually happy with his contract going forward. We don't need a Hassan Reddick kind of situation. He's got two years left on this deal after this year. So we probably want to have him agree to a mini extension, maybe tack on another couple years. The last thing we need is next season him having a holdout or a hold in and not being happy with his contract. Now, as far as trade compensation, what would we be willing to give for him? Personally, I'd give up a first for him for sure, but it might take multiple picks, maybe even multiple firsts to get him. Once you start talking about multiple picks, here's the problem. There's no guarantee he stays healthy during his contract, so you're playing a lot of eggs in one basket here. If you could guarantee he'd be healthy for the rest of his deal, then yes, he's probably worth multiple picks. But if he gets hurt and guys get hurt in the NFL all the time, now you don't have Crosby and you don't have all those picks either, which becomes a disastrous situation going forward. What do the Lions fans need to root for going forward? The Raiders are 2-5 and five on the season right now. They're playing the Chiefs this Sunday. We need to root hard for the Raiders to continue to keep losing so that Max Crosby potentially becomes available in the next couple weeks before the trade deadline. All right, now let's talk about Debo Samuel, who was hospitalized with pneumonia this week. This can be a serious issue. Typically, lung infections, they're not going to be that harmful to young, healthy people, but they can occasionally kill people. I remember a case in urgent care. It was not my patient, but a colleague saw a patient for a pretty routine bronchitis, cold symptoms. Two days later, the guy is dead. So he's a young, healthy guy in his 20s. Very shocking situation. These things can happen. Now, 
Debo Samuel was hospitalized. What does that mean? Hospitalization does not necessarily indicate severity. I worked in the hospital for many years during my training. There's a big difference in how a lot of doctors approach things. Some of them will hospitalize people for almost anything, any minor thing, and keep them there until they're fully healthy because they're afraid of a bounce back situation. That's when you discharge a patient, and then a day or two later, they have to come back. They bounce back into the hospital. A lot of doctors don't want to see that. There are other doctors who are a little bit more lenient with things. They're less willing to hospitalize people and more willing to discharge them to let them recover at home. With Debo Samuel being such a high-profile case, I can totally understand a doctor not wanting to take any chances and hospitalizing Debo even if it's minor, even if most likely it's nothing serious, and he probably could have recovered at home. Doctors do practice in fear. I know this. Anybody who's a doctor sort of knows this. The last thing you need is a high-profile situation where something extremely rare goes wrong. A Debo Samuel, you don't need that guy to get very sick, potentially even have a serious, severe situation occur. Now, as a doctor, you put yourself in a really bad position. So hospitalizing him where he can be monitored throughout the night, oxygen levels, blood pressure, vital signs are all being checked. So if anything goes wrong, he's at the hospital and there's a bunch of people around who can take care of him right away. Totally understandable that he got hospitalized, even if it wasn't anything too serious. All right, let's talk about Tua returning from his concussion. He's saying he's going to play without a guardian cap. So here's my thoughts about that. First of all, there's no good evidence that a guardian cap actually prevents concussions. But in fairness, it's very hard to find evidence with just observational, aka cohort studies. And ethically, we can't do an experimental study where we actively bash dudes on the head. Somewhere, Miles Garrett is saying, I'll do it. I'll bash guys on the head. But we can't do that. Now, for those of you and people who are saying he should wear a guardian cap, and maybe he should, well, if wearing one guardian cap is better, then why not wear two or three or five or ten? That's because there are negatives to wearing it. Now, theoretically, that extra padding of the guardian cap, it should help decrease the forces that get transmitted to the head, but it's possible that the increased mass, increased size of that guardian cap could increase whiplash forces. And that's how Tua got his last concussion when his head whiplashed backward and hit the ground. Can't say this for sure, but there can be unintended consequences with the Guardian cap. And also that increased size of the Guardian cap could result in more collisions with his head. So more possible concussion issues there. The bottom line is it's not clear cut whether Guardian cap is for sure better to avoid concussions or not. So I would not criticize Tua for returning without a guardian cap. Let's move on to the Wednesday initial injury report, which will include the Vikings game recap as well as the Tennessee Titans game preview. Really good news on the report this week, as all the players who were hurt during the Vikings game didn't end up with anything significant. Also, no surprises on the initial report, which sometimes can happen. Let's go to the Lions report. Josh Paschal, not listed with the elbow, but listed with an illness. Great news that the elbow is not on the report. He had what looked like a simple elbow contusion during the game, left the game, came back with a small elbow pad. Also left the game a little bit later with possibly a left arm issue. Good news that no arms, no elbows on on the report. He should be good for the game. Illnesses early in the week generally don't keep players out for the Sunday game, but we'll keep a close eye on the report over the next couple days. Kevin Zeitler had a groin that missed last game, but the FP on Wednesday means he's on track to play versus the Titans. Nothing serious there. Could be just a mild hip flexor or adductor strain. Graham Glasgow. Rest, Frank Ragnow with rest, Taylor Decker with rest. So all these offensive linemen with rest issues. 
With Taylor Decker, he had an atypically rough outing against the Vikings, did not play up to his usual standards. Possibly there's a minor health issue related to that. Remember that not all injuries are going to be listed on the official report. Levi Anser Rike listed it with rest. He had a minor right knee issue in week three of this year, but otherwise has been totally healthy. He's coming back from a very significant L5-S1 lumbar fusion. Who knows? Could be some kind of rest issue with that. You never know with that. That's a very significant surgery that could affect the rest of his career. Christian Mahogany, FP with an illness. He's had an FP throughout his 21-day practice window. The motto is not an issue at this point. Likely out again this week as the Lions don't need him as everybody is healthy in front of him. Expect to see him on the roster around October the 29th. Now some notables that are not listed on the report. David Montgomery was the big one. Landed hard on his left knee. There was concern there for a patella contusion, pre-patellar bursitis, or more seriously a PCL sprain. That's the kind of sprain that knocked out Khalif Raymond last year at the end of the season. Dan Campbell on Monday said it was a minor contusion to the back of his knee, which is great news. Also excellent news. He's unlisted on the report. No limitations against the Titans. Amon Ross St. Brown looked like he had a right knee contusion against the Vikings. He didn't hurt himself on the tackle or the fall, but as he was getting up, a Vikings player knocked knees with him. Didn't look like anything concerning on the video, and it's reassuring that he's not listed on the report, so great news there. Sam Laporta looked like he had a very slight right knee hyperextension last game. Didn't miss any snaps but you never know with those. Excellent news that he's unlisted. I had a couple Twitter questions that are interesting about Sam Laporta. Jarnell on X asked, do you think how bow-legged he plays is a part of some of these injuries just based off biomechanics? That's interesting. That's an interesting observation there. Remember last year, he had a left knee hyperextension where there was a varus deformity of his knee where this leg bowed out, causing the hyperextension and possibly a lateral knee strain. That bow-legged issue with his knees potentially could have been related to the hyperextension last year. This last game against the Vikings, the hyperextension did not look like it had anything to do with the bow-legged as his leg was up in the air as he got hit in the chest, causing his knee to almost whiplash and cause a hyperextension. So unrelated there. But that's something to keep an eye on going forward. So good observation there. At It's Nick K15 on X asked, do you think the injury in training camp and the ankle sprain a few weeks ago are the reason he hasn't been involved in the offense? That's possible. Dan Campbell did mention that the hamstring strain did cause a limitation during camp and possibly early on in the season. The ankle sprain was a right Low ankle sprain could have caused a mild limitation in the next game, but I don't think that was too major of an issue there. Now with Jamison Williams likely out, though, this could be the perfect time to get Laporta a breakout game. I think most of his decreased production has been the fact that we've had all our weapons really healthy this year. Amara, Gibbs, Montgomery, Tim Patrick's emergence, Jamison Williams, We just have so many weapons that not everybody's going to get their targets and touches. But right now, with JMO likely out, I think great chance for the Lions to try to increase their targets for Laporta and try to get him a breakout game. I want to make a note of James Houston, who had some good snaps versus the Vikings. He only got nine snaps during the game, but he made good use of them. Got a couple of pressures. He still doesn't have that elite bend we saw in his rookie year. He's coming off a severe right ankle injury. May never get that bend back, but he does have speed and burst that the other guys don't have on the edge. So it's worth keeping an eye on him going forward. He's a special player. The other edge rushers on the team, they just don't have the burst and speed and bend that James Houston potentially could have. 
Jamison Williams is likely going to be out this game to go do a two-game suspension. We talked about this earlier on this podcast. Even if he misses a couple games from a team standpoint, not a big issue. I don't mind guys missing a game or two due to load management reasons during a 17-game season. We're expecting to have a 2021 game season this year with a long playoff run. I have no issue. Guys resting a game or two. All the other weapons on the team are healthy right now. So just from a load management standpoint, no issue with him missing a couple games. Apparently, he's still deciding whether to appeal or not. So he might actually play this Titans game. I'm guessing that he won't appeal and he'll just take his hit with the Titans and the Packers game next week. The bottom line with him, though, as far as his suspension, hopefully this is just a one-time mental lapse where he took something a buddy gave him maybe late at night during a party for kicks. Hopefully this is not a situation where he's addicted to ADHD stimulant medications. I've seen this in clinical practice often. These stimulants can be very addictive, just as addictive as Vicodin, narcotics, or other illegal drugs, and they can be a major problem in life. The Lions probably need to really investigate this to try to figure out if there is any possible signs of addiction here, as that definitely affects whether we might want to give him a long-term extension in the next couple years, how we want to approach him, and how much we want to rely on him in the short term. And just from his own health standpoint, if there is any kind of addiction going on, he needs treatment, he needs support to try to make sure he can overcome any kind of issue there. Again, this is just total speculation here. No definite signs that he has any addiction. But if there is anything like that, need to take it seriously. Emmanuel Mosley, Dan Campbell had a couple comments about him on Wednesday. Dan Campbell said he's coming back this year and he's doing good right now. He tore his pec around August the 5th. If Mosley has the same timeline as C.J. Gardner-Johnson, which was a 16-week timeline, he'll be back for Thanksgiving against the Bears. So that would be great news there. Broderick Martin suffered a right knee hyperextension on August the 24th has been on IR since. It's a bit disappointing he has still not started his 21-day practice window yet. Was hoping that I'd see him start it this week, but maybe next week. Hopefully soon for Broderick Martin. All right, now let's get to the Tennessee Titans. Will Levis had a right shoulder AC joint sprain, missed last game. It's looking like reports are that he'll miss this game against the Lions as well. His status may be more of a coach's decision, though, than a medical decision. If it's truly a medical decision, though, the Lions secondary are hoping for a quick recovery as he's already thrown seven interceptions this year. Legereus Sneed with an NP due to a quad. He missed last game also. The NP suggests he'll be out again, which would be a big loss. Calvin Ridley was a surprise NP with a foot. He's their starting wide receiver with 12 receptions for 183 yards this year. Jalen Duncan, a backup offensive tackle, had an NP with a hamstring. Ty J. Spears, running back, LP with a hamstring. He has 33 carries for 114 yards this year. Keandre Coburn, defensive tackle, LP with a knee. He's missed the last two games and he only plays limited snaps. Cedric Gray, linebacker, FP with a shoulder. He's a fourth-round rookie who's yet to play this year due to injury. A couple very notable trades for the Titans. DeAndre Hopkins, their wide receiver with 15 receptions for 173 yards this year, traded to the Chiefs for a fifth-round pick that can turn into a fourth-rounder. Ernest Jones, their starting linebacker who's been playing about 100% of snaps this year was traded to the Seahawks in exchange for Jerome Baker, a linebacker, and a fourth-round pick. All right, that is the rundown for the Wednesday injury report. Really overall good news for the Lions, except for Jamison Williams' suspension. Enjoy the game on Sunday. Thanks for listening.